Good morning. Welcome to Westview Baptist Church. My name is Rick Bowling. I'm the pastor of Westview. We're so glad you could join us today. Today we have a special day planned. We're going to be participating in the Lord's Supper. So if you would grab a, a glass of juice, water, um, something that you have to drink, um, and if you uh, have a, some, a cracker, a piece of bread, whatever you may have, and we'll be doing that at the latter part of the message, so you can be doing that while I'm saying a few words. Uh, we certainly want to welcome you today as you've come to, to worship with us. And hey, if you would like to contribute to the ministry here at Westview, you may do so by going online to wbcshelby.org, uh, or you can donate through Venmo through Westview Baptist Church that way as well. So we're so glad. We're going to jump in with a... Uh, illustration I want to use from a children's story. It was about a boy and his horse and he has this horse and and of course he's a rider and he competes in horse events where where they show the horse and they do all these different types of competitions showing the horse and you know how um, graceful and, and the, his ability to do the different things and so the boy knew it was important that he practice a lot in riding the horse and and certainly teaching things but it was basically the practice was so that the horse would get all of the attention. In other words, they wanted to see the beauty in what the horse does and how he performed these different things. To see the beauty in it, it was really important that the boy would practice until he achieved oneness with the horse. I mean, they were just like so fluent that suddenly it was one. And of course, the horse is a huge animal. So that's what you saw. Well, folks, the same is true for us. Our lives need to be fluent with the Holy Spirit. So fluent with God that others will see God in us, not us. In fact, God gives us free will, free will to, to work with the Holy Spirit so that his purposes are achieved for his glory. Today, the message is this, do all for the glory of God. So we're going to be looking in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we got a few verses in chapter 9 we're going to be looking at, verses 19 through 23, and then we're going to be looking at chapter 10. Uh, I want to begin, uh, as we think about this first point that we're going to jump into, in, in chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, to follow my example as I have followed the example of Christ. And it's interesting, when we think about that, some versions say, imitate me as I have imitated Christ. And so the first point, kind of a cliche type word, but it's good, it's, it's a current relevant way to remember this. He's, I'm going to use this, don't be haters, be imitators. That was being an imitator of Christ. Don't be a hater, be an imitator. And so let's just jump right into the scripture as we look at verse 20. Um, this is what Paul says in chapter 9. He says this, or well, actually we're going, to verse, we're going to start with verse 19. He says, though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. And so Paul is already talking about being a slave, a servant, and for this whole purpose, to achieve that oneness, he is going to make himself one with Christ, and that's what he wants them to see. And so this is what he does. He says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. And we'll just stop right there. Paul respected the customs of Judaism is what he's saying. You know, they, had, they ate the kosher food, um, the observance of the holidays. Um, of course, he was, had, because he had previously been a Jew, he was already circumcised. But he might go to their, uh, you know, if someone was being circumcised, I guess he could participate as a bystander. Um, but in any way... As long as he, they didn't think whatever he was doing, or he wasn't advocating this, that it considered putting them in right standing with God. That's not what did that. And Paul knows that and has taught that. But he was okay. Why did he do that? As he says, so that he may uh, win anyone as possible. He says, to the Jew I became like a Jew to win the Jews. That means to win the Jews to Christ. He was doing everything for the glory of God. Second thing in that chapter, in verse 20, he says, To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Well, we're going to find in a minute he was under a law, but not their law. Uh, 
Paul was saying, coming under the law, he was going to make himself a slave under the law. He was going to be, he was going to make himself a servant. He's, in, he's in, uh, telling us, make ourselves a servant for the sake of others under the law, not because we're obligated to, but for the sake of the others. In other words, to help win them to Christ. That's another, that's a piece of it. We'll talk about some law type stuff here in just a minute. Let's look at what he says in verse 22. He goes on and he says, um, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 21, to those not having the law, he says, I became like one not having the law. He says, though I'm not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those who are not having the law. In other words, Paul begins talking about in Christ. In Christ, God's, that's what he's talking about. In Christ's law, God's law is written on our heart. It's the very thing that the prophet um, Ezekiel said was going to come true. And Paul is talking about that. This is what Ezekiel said in, in 36, chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. And he says, and be careful to keep all my laws. And so here's the point that, that Paul is making is that when Christ is within you, God's law is written upon your heart, just like Ezekiel said. That time has come. And so he's saying to those, by the way, those not under the law, he's talking about the Gentiles, the unbelievers, uh, and of course, you know, a Jewish person believed in God, but they had to accept Christ just like a, a Gentile did as well. And so for them, he's saying, I'm making myself under Christ's law, which is written on my heart. You don't have to do all these other things. You don't have to be circumcised. I'm under Christ's law, basically whether I'm under the, the Judaism law or under not having law at all, I'm still under Christ's law, no matter what. There are laws that we experience every day. There's a, I, I talk, spoke about this in my newsletter, some different ones. I'm going to give you a different one. Uh, I talked about obeying the speed limit. How about the laws of nature? Uh, there was a woman recently, I saw a little video online, and there was, it was in a national park. They had this little, uh, you know, stone brick walls built up about three feet, a little viewing spot. You could view down through this area, and it had a big sign. If uh, bears come out, if they come closer than 100 feet, you need to get in your car. You have time to do that. And so this lady had her, her, her camera, she was video, and, the, and this bear started coming closer. It was a mama bear with her cubs. It got closer than 100 feet. And somebody else was videoing her while she was doing this, and they were trying to tell. Finally, the bear charged at her, and she, fortunately, she got in the car. Because under the laws of nature, that bear could have mauled her to death. Fortunately, man's law... She was fined $1,000 and spent four days in jail for violating that. Very serious. Uh, I'm sure she probably won't ever do that again. There's only one law to live by, and that is Christ's law. And whether it's observing the laws of nature, the laws of man or the land, whatever the laws of the land, whatever it may be, if Christ's law is written on your heart, we will do these things for the glory of God. Well, let's look about one other area that Paul talks about. If we go down to verse 22, he says, To the weak I became weak to win the weak. And, you know, this idea of, of the weak, he was talking about, he was, you know, we know Paul worked with his hands. He worked so that uh, no one would have to support him. And he did, he was willing to work with the marginalized. It didn't matter whoever, whomever. He, uh, but he became the weak with those. He would work with those folks, which a lot of people would not even be seen with another person that was poor or marginalized, whatever you want to say. And Paul was saying, I became weak as to win the weak to Christ. In fact, he says this as he concludes. He says, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. But, you know, Paul, we know that, I mean, he was basically doing this all for the glory of God. And so, he was being an imitator of Christ. So don't be a hater, be an imitator of Christ. That's his first, the first point. Let's look at the second thing. Uh, 
we're going to jump down in chapter 10 and Paul begins to talk about this idea of self-confidence is useless. And so he says, what we need to do is we need to cultivate God confidence. Self-confidence is useless. Cultivate God confidence. That's our second point for the day. Paul, in the very first oh, 12 verses or so, he gives the, the people a, a step warning. He's like, don't repeat the mistakes as your of your ancestors and as they have done. We all probably have had some generational sin in our families, and uh, most of us has repeated that at some level. Maybe you've been able to break free of that. That's great. And Paul has given these warnings with our ancestors that really cover a lot of areas. And so he begins, he says, For I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, the brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. Paul's talking about them, you know, he says, the, and that they were uh, under the cloud, and they passed through the sea. In other words, God led them through the sea. Uh, you remember that? He was a cloud in the day and a fire at night. In the, as he led them, he says, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. You see, that was their form of baptism is what he's saying, just like we have our baptism in Christ. And uh, they were baptized in Moses in the cloud and the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food. We know they had manna and quail that came from heaven. Spiritually, it was provided. And they drank from the same spiritual drink. They had water that was provided out of a rock even at times. But then he, he takes a twist and he says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. He was, there was someone accompanying him. Did you know that Jesus was in the Old Testament? If you, have, if you want to write this down, I encourage you to do it. Chapter 10, verse 4. They accompanied them. He says, they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Now, he goes on to say, nevertheless, um, with all that, nevertheless, God was, was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. After this beautiful thing, he reminded them that they were obstinate, stubborn, disobedient in the midst of this. They were self-confident. And, oh, my goodness, he's saying, don't repeat the same mistakes as your ancestors. Because we're going to see what happens next is that that this temptation is always lurking. It's always around us. And God promises there'll be a way out. If you jump down to verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken taken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but what you, when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Notice that temptation, again, I'll say it, is always lurking, but God promises he'll help you out. So what are we to do? What are we to do when this temptation comes? Look what he says in verse 14. He says, therefore, my dear friends, flee, flee from idolatry, like an idol worship, idolatry. And we think of idolatry in different ways, but when he says flee, he's like, run, bolt. I mean, let's, you got to get out of here. We look in the Old Testament, we see where in the Ten Commandments in chapter 20, verses 3 and 4, you know, he talks about, you know, don't worship any idols before you don't, any graven images don't make anything. Um, over in verse 17, he talks about don't covet your neighbor or the things they have. You know, that's a form of idolatry that, uh, you know, when you're co coveting something. And, and so... You know, we're wondering, uh, okay, now what, what else is he talking about here? Well, this stiff warning that he was talking about, he goes back up in the scriptures. And, and we see this. We see what he says here when he says, these things occurred examples to, to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Talking about the, the Israelites. Do not be idolaters, he says it again, as some of them were. As some of them were. He says, as it is written. The people, they sat down to eat and drink and got up and indulged in reveling. He's, what is all this? We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And he talks about what happened. One day, 23,000 of them were, were killed um, by snakes. I mean, it was, he says, don't test Christ. He even says, don't grumble as some of them did. And they were killed by the destroying angel. And he says, these things happened to them as examples they were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages have come. 
So he says, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And that's when he talks about the temptation. And we're going, how, how do we, you know, how do we get this? How can we see what he's talking about here? I mean, idolatry, we, Paul's going to address it a little deeper in just a minute in another form. But what was relates to us, we may not be or, uh, worshiping a, a wooden object or a big idol, you know, in a temple. But Paul addresses the Colossians in 3, 5, and he says this. He calls this idolatry. He says, put therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he gives a list, sexual immorality, impurity, lust. Lusting after it could be a person or thing. You see, that's, it makes that an, them an idol. Uh, you can be making sexual immorality and impurity. You, you, it can be so focused on it becomes an idol, he's saying. Uh, all those things. Um, because of this, he says, uh, okay, so he says, which is idolatry? He says, oh, evil desires and greed. Man, I mean, we have seen, we look throughout history, and we think in our common, we can see all these obvious things, sexual immorality, lust, all those kind of things, greed, and evil desires. You know, I think of what's the closest form to an idol back in, in the Second World War with um, Adolf Hitler, the people idolized him, and they would do things. These evil desires entered in because they made him an idol. And the atrocities of what they did, I'm reading a book right now about a man who survived the Holocaust, and he just finished write, uh, writing it. He's 100 years old. And horrible stuff. And he's, the book's titled The Happiest Man Alive. He found where his happiness was, even in the midst of all that. But we see these desires that enter in that are so deep. Uh, just saw another day where a man uh, hit a, a woman, uh, ran over with an SUV in a parking lot. Not only did he run it, he, he did it multiple times. And unfortunately, she did not survive it. They have it on video. Uh, don't know exactly what happened. But something was not right in there. Whether it was a mental snap or something, it could be, it was, we don't know. But there's a lot going on that, we can see that um, is, is a horrifying type situations where evil desire may enter into people when they begin to idolize or have an idol worship of some form. Well, Paul knew this, and it was kind of crazy. He goes on. I'm not going to read this next little section because I want to save it for the end. He starts talking about, um, right after this small section I'm talking about, he talks about this idea of the Corinthians, and they're, they're of eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And so he begins to separate it, and he gets up there in, in verses uh, maybe like 19 through 22, and he starts talking about them going into the temple where the altars were made, and, uh, and they had pagan, this was pagan temples, and uh, meat that was being sacrificed, and he was like, you can't go sit at the, they would go in there and have meals. And he says, you can't go eat in those temples. It's, this is de demonic. In fact, he uses this word right here. He says, um, food that sacrifice, he says, uh, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to be pissed with demons. You can't drink. Now, the section I was telling you I'm leaving out is because we're having the Lord's Supper. He talks about going and having the Lord's Supper. He's like, you can't go in these temples and participate in that and then come and participate in the Lord's Supper. They're incompatible. And so we can see that this whole idea, he's like, the, this self-confidence is useless, but we have to cultivate the God confidence to overcome all these temptations and this idol worship. And he starts to break that down in a, in a new way in here in just a minute. Because he starts talking about, what about when you're not, you're eating some meat. Meat was sold in the marketplace after that that was left over that had been in those temples. You know, was well, that okay? What if you don't know? And so we're going to get into that. But I just want you to hear that, that we're to do all for the glory of God. We're going to see what he means by that in this next session. So if you will, the third point I want you to see is our believer's freedom in Christ. And so let's look at verse 23 and 24. This is what Paul says. Now, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. 
No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So what Paul is saying is, and we see this picture of the believer's freedom that we have, that he's saying, not like, yes, we're not to go in situations like these they were doing and going in these pagan temples. Um, that's off limits. He's saying you can't do that and go to the table. But what about these other areas? He says, eat anything, verse 25, anything that's sold in the market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything's in it, and everything in it. Just like he told Paul, Peter and Cornelius, you know, about Nothing is unclean. Now, I'm declaring everything clean. But even this stuff, because you're, you're not participating in that, and this meat that's left over may have been used for some of that, it's okay, because you, you don't know that. You have no clue. It's mixed in with all the other. And he goes on, he talks about even if a believer invites you to a meal that you want to go over and eat, he says, whatever, he says eat whatever's put before you without raising a question of conscience. He says, but if someone says this has been offered in sacrifice, he said, now that's different. He said, then don't eat it. He says, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. He says, I'm not referring to your conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience. He says, for why is my freedom, I'm okay with it, but why is it being judged by another's conscience? It may, if I take part in a meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? He's not, they're the weaker one. He's saying, I don't want them to fall. The first thing we need to see in that is, notice what Paul says, everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Paul was saying, let's first help others live well. Philippians 2, 4, he said, don't look to, only to yourselves, but to the interest of others. It's not all about you. Romans 15, 1, 3. He says some very similar things. He, he talks about, uh, you know, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. He says each of, uh, each of us should please our neighbor for their good to build them up. He said even this is what Christ did. He, to, he says um, he didn't please himself as is written. The insults of those who are given, he has taken them upon himself to, to insult you. And so we see this picture of that, that, that we're not to do that. And now what he's saying, when we come with that reasoning, he's saying, don't send any mixed messages. That's what he didn't want to happen to them. For these people who were going to be at the Lord's table to participate in the Lord's Supper, he knew that if they knew that meat was there, then that may be a stumbling block for the other person who were trying to win to Christ. And so we see how important that is. It's important for us today in our culture today. There's so many things that can take place. And I don't have time to get in a lot of detail on this. I think about even our pandemic with COVID. There's so much here. There, there's becoming so much division. Um, you know, we have those uh, people that support the vaccine and people that don't support the vaccine. People that wear a mask and people that don't wear a mask. And so it may depend on situations. I get all that, um, you know, about keeping the distance and and just having respect for one another. And he's like, you, if we don't have respect for the other person, then how are we going to come together to table? You do whatever you do for the glory of God. Remember that. Remember to respect each one of us to respect the other person, knowing where they're coming from. If you know that about them, and and uh, you can assume. You know, uh, so it's it's just so good to do that because that's what's being Christ-like. Uh, hear that. There's other areas. That's just one. I'm just using that. And so notice how Paul concludes this. This is what he says. Um, he says, so whether you eat or drink, verse 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble, he says, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, he says, for I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And then he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In other words, be an imitator of Christ. Wow. So Paul did all this, and he included the Lord's Supper in there, and I'm going to come to that in, here in just one second. 
because he knew how important it was for us to be together. In fact, over in chapter 11, he begins talking about the Lord's Supper, and he's telling them, some of them were coming. Listen, they had a meal, a full meal together when they took the Lord's Supper. And so he, he talked about the people that would come that, that had means, and they would, they would eat all the food, and some people would drink all the drink. And the poor, they got shoved out. And he's like, do this stuff at home. No, this, we need to be one. And I want to read from Eugene Peterson's what he was saying before he talked about the mixing of these, these worship things and the difference, the, the, the incompatibility of those two, like the ones of the pagan worships. And what he was talking about, what happens when we come together. This is from uh, chapter 11, and uh, excuse me, chapter 10, verses 15 through 18. He says, I assume I'm addressing believers who are now mature. Draw your own conclusions. We drink the cup of blessing. Aren't we taking it? Uh, when we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't it the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take it into ourselves, the body, the very life of Christ? Because there's one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what he is. And he finishes by telling them this is basically what Israel did. He says those, the old Israel, he said those who ate the sacrifice offered on God's altar entered into God's action in the altar. And so we're entering into God's action as we come together to take the Lord's Supper now. But Paul gave a warning. He says you must examine yourself first. That's important to do that. And so I pray that you do that now. He says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And he says, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And so he says, that's why many of uh, uh, were weak and sick and had fallen asleep, had died. He was talking about that. So, Lord, we examine ourselves. Lord, I pray that you show us in these moments anything that is not of you, Lord, we ask that we see that and we ask for forgiveness, Lord, and we come to you with a clean heart. Lord, may we do that in Jesus' name as we do that now to participate in your supper. So Paul, he reminds the Corinthians just like he's reminding us what happened on that, that night with Jesus. And he says, what I've received from the Lord, I've passed on you. The Lord that Jesus on that night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and, when he, and he gave thanks. And once he had given thanks, and Lord, we thank you for this bread. He broke it. This bread that represents your body. He says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup the cup of the new covenant, he said, this is my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. Whenever you drink this cup, you, he says, do this in remembrance of me. So, Lord, we do remember you. I pray that you're at the forethought of our hearts. And let's just continue in prayer right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, that Everything you did was for the glory of God. Lord, that you have forgiven us for our sins so that all who believe, Lord, <coughs> we may <in> turn, <coughs> excuse me, enter into eternal life with you. Lord, I pray that we do that for those who do not know you, that if you're hearing this message now and he's drawing you in this way, you ask for that forgiveness of sins of your sinful nature and all your sins, past, present, and future. And believe that Jesus is Lord. Believe that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that he is Lord. The, the word says that you shall be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so may in our, many, may in our manyness we become oneness as we participate together and that we do all for the glory of God. I want to thank you for joining us today. And hey, if you have come to know the Lord today, please contact me at wbcshelby.org.
or a local pastor or trusted friend that's a believer in your community. God bless you.